Lingard and, and Keddy. And what they do is they set out uh, some of the ideas uh, that we find within Nancy Fraser's work around um, uh, uh, how we can take critical theory and look for s um, social injustice, not just in economic terms, but how that intersects with notions of um, identity recognition. Uh, uh, we might refer to this as identity politics and also then uh, representation uh, of diverse views, opinions, uh, 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 bodies, sexualities, ethnicities at decision making levels in our society. Now, their article opens up, uh, Lingard and Ketty's article opens up with a, a quote from, from Bourdieu, right? Uh, in which Bourdieu says the following. In fact, to favor the most favored and disfavor the most disfavored, all that is necessary and sufficient is for the school to ignore in its content and teaching, uh, in its methods and techniques, and in the criteria of judgment that it deploys, the cultural inequalities that divide children from different social classes. In other words, by treating all students, however much they differ, as equal in rights and duties, the educational system actually gives its sanction to the initial inequality in relation to culture. Okay, now what is Bourdieu saying here? Bourdieu is not suggesting that some culture, in terms of ethnicity, um, is... Uh, better than another one. What he is referring to here is that the culture of a particular socioeconomic class uh, is valued in our education system, and that is uh, the middle classes. And what he's saying here is that one of the most effective ways that we can reproduce inequality in our education system is by assuming that all of our learners come through the door equal. That every one of our learners comes through the door uh, exactly the same. And then teaching them from that point. And the challenge of that we can think about uh, uh, for with the example, say, of, of my daughters. I remember one school that I was working in, one of my colleagues, um, uh, would talk to me about the new entrant. She was a reception room uh, teacher, the new entrants that would come in at five years old and how some five-year-olds would be able to uh, read and write their name. They'd have the alphabet down, numbers up to maybe 10. Um, they'd be able to name the colors, uh, several of the shapes. Uh, these are things that we value in our education system right from five years old. Uh, they knew how to maybe share an item they knew how to sit and look like they were paying attention. Uh, and she would talk about how other students would come in uh, with none of that. Uh, wouldn't be able to toilet themselves, wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't have any of those sorts of things that would be valued within this middle class education system. Right? And if you, uh, uh, you know, there are studies that, that show that uh, children as young as five uh, work out what the teacher values and students that are effective in this education system work out what the teacher values and reflect that back to the teacher. So they'll be the ones, the five-year-olds, where the teacher says, come and sit on the mat, and they'll come down and they'll make sure they sit on the mat in the right form and in the right spot just in front of uh, the the teacher and so on, they get noticed. But Dan, on the other hand, who's maybe really struggling with any of these sorts of ideas of trying to be settled and share and, um, uh, you know, use an alphabet or hold a pen in any way other than a fist and so on. There I am way back on the edge of the mat, not paying attention, mucking around. And immediately I start to, um, uh, unconsciously create uh, a view that I'm not a good learner, right? And if we think about 
what leads to those two different students coming into school if we think about, as I say, my own daughter. Uh, my oldest daughter, here she is at five years old. She comes from a home with um, a, a middle-class home. She comes from uh, a, a highly literate home with uh, highly literate parents. Uh, she's well-fed. Uh, she doesn't know hunger or material uh, 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 need, for example. Um, and if we take the view that she is the same student, or I should approach my education of her in the same way as the next student who maybe comes from a, a single working parent home uh, where it may be casual work uh, that's irregular, that this child may have grown up having to go to different carers while uh, their primary carer was uh, working. Um, Maybe they've known hunger. Maybe they've been cold. Uh, if we assume that these two five-year-olds start their education career at the same point, then my daughter wins every time. And we reproduce that inequality in the system. Right? So where Bourdieu, what Bourdieu is saying here is that if we say, I'm going to treat all my learners the same when they walk through the door, we are reproducing the inequality that they start with, okay? And as we get into our secondary space, this becomes harder and harder to disrupt, I think. Now, if we look at social mobility, the idea of being able to move between classes, I got real fancy here and linked. Um, you can click on here and link this. You know, uh, uh, an article in The Guardian uh, uh, from two years ago talks about how social mobility in the UK, moving from working class to middle class and so on, um, is has stopped. Um, education no longer serves the function of being able to interrupt your social conditions at birth. And what's happened, you know, uh, uh, Theorists that talk about this will argue that what's happening is we put further barriers in place uh, as elites or as middle class around access into the sorts of schools that uh, lead to uh, success or whatever else. Uh, and it might be, I think we talked about this during our tutorial last week, it might be thinking about an additional barrier of needing a further degree. Um, where perhaps it once was one degree was enough, now you need a degree and a certificate. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the Diploma of Teaching Secondary. So we find these different sorts of um, barriers that can be put in place in terms of access to particular classes. And in fact, um, a study out of the States a couple of years ago um, uh, from uh, a, a, a researcher out of Harvard, he was talking about how inequality is getting worse, but we're just not interacting with people from different kinds of communities. You know, social media is really good at providing an echo chamber for ourselves. Think about it. When was the last time you went on your social media and encountered people that really disagreed with you? Um, you know, we, or our news feeds that get pushed through to us by different metrics. Um, you know, these are all curated in a way that means we rarely encounter um, something significantly different to ourselves. Um, and um, in uh, this article, you know, it's a, written for a newspaper, the idea of, you know, that inequality is now so great, it's getting worse, but we're simply not interacting with uh, people, we're not seeing it. And that can lead the, to the question, you know, is it a thing here, right? Now, um, Toby Morris is shot to international stardom with his um, uh, sort of cartoons around uh, the uh, coronavirus response, right? Um, but as an illustrator for the spinoff, um, he also creates something uh, that he calls the inequality tower. Uh, and now in this, what he essentially does is he says, okay, all of um, New Zealand's wealth, um, we're going to divvy up and give to 100 people 
or separate them out as though there's 100 people live in this tower of um, all of New Zealand's wealth. So he looks at it and says, who owns the different floors? Okay. So this is um, savings, property, assets, all of that stuff. And he says, all right, here it is. This is a 10-story building. So who owns different floors? One person or 1% 1 owns the top 2.2 floors, right? The next 9% owns the next 3.7 floors. So how much does the top 10% of New Zealanders own in terms of our national wealth? Do the math, right? Then what we find is that we encounter the middle classes. And here in the middle classes, we start to get almost a one-to-one, -one, right? 40% uh, own 39% of the country's wealth, right? So that gets us to 50%. 50% of our country owns 2% of its wealth, right? Uh, and this is really quite striking. And what we find actually is that over time it has gotten worse. He did one of these towers in 2015. And he said that, uh, you know, we can see the statistics, the number of people that owned, um, you know, in, in that owned 50% um, uh, dropped significantly. The number of people that owned uh, the top 1% dropped significantly. So we start to see fewer and fewer people uh, owning more and more of the country's wealth. And, um, but uh, it's something that perhaps we don't pay as much attention to. And, and one of the things, one of the ideas or theories that gets thrown around is the idea that because it affects the middle classes, where the middle classes hasn't changed significantly, um, you know, we might talk about the middle class squeeze, uh, but um, it's largely the middle classes that will be active in terms of voting and, and participation and so on. And if they're not really that fussed, not that much will happen. Yeah. So some interesting ideas that come out of, of that. Um, now, um, he's also teamed up uh, to look at different ways of sort of addressing poverty and, and understanding poverty with a historic view in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, which you'll be able to find at this link here. All right, that leads us into Nancy Fraser's three R's. So this is the guts of what um, uh, uh, Bob Lingard and, and uh, Amanda Ketty are writing about when they're uh, writing the article that was uh, one of the, the readings for this week. And they talk about her three R's. So Nancy Fraser came up with a view that said we need to have uh, redistribution, recognition, and representation. Okay, so here, um, Ketty, um, Amanda Ketty, in an earlier article, she writes for Fraser's socio-economic injustices turn up. Remember, this is that Marxist-based view. Turn up the socio-economic. They arise when the structures of society generate a maldistribution or class inequality for particular social groups. Cultural injustice arises when institutionalized or hierarchical patterns of cultural value generate misrecognition of, or, uh, of status. Now, we might look at that and say, you know, for example, um, uh, cultural value of um, um, non-waged work in the home. Uh, what uh, occurs with, uh, uh, you know, for example, much of that homework is, is um, sort of culturally undertaken by women for, for a long time, you know? Uh, and so we start to see uh, these structures that uh, impact on uh, a particular social group. Um, there's been some really interesting think pieces coming out around sort of the impact of lockdown and COVID-19 on gender dynamics in a mixed gender home, right? Um, and political injustices arise when some individuals or groups are not accorded equal voice in decision making about justice claims. Okay, so as we start to think about this, we can think about um, Nancy's three R's, Nancy Fraser's three R's. Sorry, how rude of me to. So, um, in the top right corner, again, I've linked um, uh, 
whew, got really creative with my links here. Um, a story, this was a, a phenomenal um, uh, news headline a little while ago um, that said that GDP growth is constrained by low unemployment. <laughs> if we think about that statement, right? Um, now, the article itself isn't as damning as that, but this economist, you know, this, this view that says, okay, we've got too many people in work, and so that's a problem. You know, we're not going to be able to grow as much as a country. <laughs> which fundamentally flips the idea of enabling everybody to be able to find work with, uh, with integrity. Um, redistribution then is looking at uh, distributive justice that recognizes the links between poverty, poor schooling performance, early school leaving, future economic deprivation and social discontent or dysfunction. Okay. So here we're thinking about, well, how are we ensuring that there is a distribution of wealth that ensures equitable outcomes for a society, right? Um, so this is, uh, in, in Nancy Fraser's work, the economic focus. But she says it's not just economic things that occur. There's also politics of recognition, for example, um, if uh, somebody identifies as a uh, Maori or identifies as uh, 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 gender diverse uh, or from a minority sexual group. Uh, so we encounter then uh, different ways in which uh, recognition uh, can lead to oppression and subordination or a lack of recognition can lead to that. Um, if we think about how recently it's been that we're, uh, we've legislated same-sex marriage in New Zealand. Uh, so these sorts of things occur first by uh, supporting the recognition of somebody's identity. Now, um, this is a, um, he's a, a Finnish author, I think, so Ikahemo, I think is how I pronounce his name, writes that recognition is something of vital importance that individuals and groups need and often struggle for, something that can both motivate emancipatory political movements and function as an evaluation of just how well we're doing, right? Now, um, again, I've linked uh, up here um, Russell Bishop, who's a, um, a, a, a Māori academic who writes about uh, Māori educational initiatives. We'll encounter some of his work next week. Uh, he wrote, um, after the review of... Um, um, tomorrow's schools that actually Māori education needs more than what's occurring. We need to enable this recognition of Māori uh, as a, a key function within, you know, he's not writing about it within the three R's, but Nancy Fraser would say this is part of um, uh, the three R framework. And then of course we get into representation. Now it's an election year, here we go. Um, um, you know, um, and this is an article from, from the spinoff, um, where, for example, uh, not, it's not sufficient to have, uh, rep, uh, recognition to say, okay, we have identity politics now, and we recognize the position of, of Māori as tangata whenua in New Zealand. Well, what does that actually mean? Unless... Uh, tangata whenua are at the decision-making table, right? So Jack McDonald, who um, had been in the Green Party, he says, we need Māori Party candidates uh, in this government or in the next government. And he says, you know, this is indicative of a much wider issue in the Labour Party with the largest Māori caucus in parliamentary history on major issues such as ihumata. Uh, Oranga Tamariki uh, and the recent Fana Ora claim, uh, they're failing to deliver on Kaupapa Māori. We need more independent Māori MPs to hold Labour to account while working with them to get across the line in government. So a really interesting view here to say, uh, I'm leaving Parliament, I'm a Green Party member, and I think the person who should um, fill my seat in, that I'm contesting um, 
uh, should be from a different party to mine. Because representation matters in the decision-making uh, uh, positions uh, for our country. All right, so now this three R's helps us as we get into the idea of um, Lingard and Ketty's review. And actually, you know, what they found um, in their study, and their study was of a state in Australia, is that teachers really cared, right? They really cared about their students, and this is a good thing. And what they found was that um, if the students were coming from uh, more socially disadvantaged spaces, teachers were as effective at caring for those students as um, uh, teachers uh, where students weren't coming from uh, positions of disadvantage. But what they found was that the pedagogy was different. What was occurring was that uh, there was a pedagogy of care, but it was what they call a pedagogy of indifference. We were saying, we're going to care for you. We're going to, we have this uh, care that we're, we're um, exercising or acting out as professionals. But for Lingard and Ketty, they say, in fact, those students from disadvantaged contexts needed something else. They needed access into the kinds of cultural knowledge of the middle classes. Uh, and this means uh, uh, that our teachers needed to be uh, doing something differently. And they write this, working towards greater equity for all students, but especially those who are economically and culturally marginalized, Productive pedagogies will, in Nancy Fraser's terms, combine a politics of economic redistribution with a politics of cultural recognition and political representation. So in relation to distributive justice, these pedagogies will assist marginalized students to access the cultural capital of the dominant. These pedagogies will be intellectually demanding and reflect high expectations in ways that assist marginalized students to achieve on the same standards as their more privileged counterparts. Now, next week, when we start looking at our, our, our next weekly focus on, on Kaupapa Māori and the Māori educational experience, we'll encounter a term uh, called um, sort of deficit theory deficit theorizing, viewing somebody as deficient because they don't have X, Y, and Z. They don't have these things that we may find in their student, uh, a more privileged counterpart. And what uh, Lingard and Ketty here are saying is that if we say we care for them, they've got a really tough background, this is really hard, we need to just um, affi them and care for them in this space, and that's where we leave it then we do them a disservice. And that in fact, our job is to not uh, forget the need to have high expectations of their academic success uh, and their ability to succeed in the same way as their counterparts. All right, so the quote goes on, they will support a more equitable distribution of the material benefits of schooling in society destabilizing the social class structures that generate economic exploitation, marginalization, and deprivation for particular groups. Okay. These are big claims and big calls. And we might be sitting here thinking, well, what does that, how, you know, how do I sort of interrupt structural exploitation of particular marginalized groups? Uh, and we will discuss this further in our class. And it, uh, in our tutorial, and you know, I had a conversation with a, a former student, um, actually now, who's who's teaching, and some of the acts that she's taking that are uh, rooted within a critical theory approach, uh, that aren't marching on Parliament and uh, uh, running massive protests, but are fundamentally. Uh, uh, about addressing a social injustice within her realm of influence. Uh, so we will discuss that further. 
Now, critical theory's uh, taken on uh, broader views over the last sort of 30 or 40 years to take in feminist theories, queer theories, gender and sexuality, um, ethnicity, uh, climate change, you know, and beyond. Anywhere there is active exploitation, uh, uh, active social injustice, um, uh, people are operating out of critical theories in an attempt to um, uh, address uh, that subordination and domination. Yeah, all right, oh, Calvin. Yep, here he is being dominated by um, his um, his teachers. Uh, we'll um, be back in just a moment to look at um, the next example, uh, uh, drawing on Paulo Freire. Uh, so I have a good cup of tea, and we'll see you in a moment. <laughs> 